Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today and for the snow outside and for a warm place to study. It's so cold. And we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to um, come among us and to open our hearts and minds to your truth and that we can understand um, this topic of the Antichrist. And we thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so tonight <clears throat> the study is Antichrist Part 2, and the intent of the study is to identify the Antichrist. So last yeah. night, I mean, not last night, well, last week. Not last week, week before last. last. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> week before last week. We all were left hanging because the last study was really good. But, and then the focus of the study is that we're all going to make a decision, decision at some point whether we are going to follow Jesus Christ or the Antichrist. And this study identifies without a doubt who the Antichrist is and what he is doing. So, <clears throat> God wants us to know the truth and so that we won't be deceived. And the main, you know, the main point isn't the beast or the Antichrist. The main point is that, I mean, although this study is specifically identifying who the Antichrist is, the main point is that Satan wants worship, and he's behind, this is his entity that he works through to deceive people and to get worship. So, let's start with going to 1 John, and we're this first few texts we're going to be um, looking at the different names for this Antichrist power in the Bible. The first text is John, 1 John chapter 2 and verses 18 and 22, and then chapter 4 and verse 3. And we could probably recite this. <laughs> you know, it starts pretty on the first 18 of chapter 2 of First John. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. And verse 23, 3, 22, Joanna. Who is a liar? He that denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, but denies the Father and the Son. Alright, in chapter 4 and verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. Alright, and Second John chapter 1 and verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Alright, so, um, what is the name here that describes this power? Antichrist. Okay, and what, there's two main characteristics of uh, this power. Number one, in verse 23, it says he is a liar because he denies Christ. And verse chapter, verse 7 of chapter 1 of, of 2 John says that this is a deceiver. So it's he's a liar and he, and he denies and and also it says that he doesn't confess Jesus Christ. So, who does the Bible say is the father of lies? Satan. It's Satan. And you can see that in John 8, 44. So, and who does the Bible say that cannot lie? God. 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 So, if this Antichrist is a liar, who is behind it? Satan. Satan. Very good. Okay. So, let's go to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3. Second Thessalonians, I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Don't listen to me, look to, at your paper. Um, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. <clears throat> Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So what is the name of the entity here? Man of sin. Man of sin. Man of sin. Man of sin. Son of perdition. And the only other time the son of perdition is mentioned in the Bible is in reference to Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Christ. And was he a open, violent opposer of Christ? Uh, no. no, he was kind of a professed follower. Yeah, he was a professed follower, and he was a silent imposter. And an imposter is someone who um, makes a false um, claims of identity or is a liar. So again, this shows that who is behind this power. Satan. Satan. And then also, verse four says that this power opposes God and exalts himself above God, which Satan um, did the same thing in the beginning. And so you can see that Satan is behind his power. So let's go next to Revelation 13. So we see, we saw that the Antichrist and the man of sin, or son of perdition, is the name for the same same, same, um, man of sin or son of perdition and the Antichrist are the same name for, are different names for the same entity. So let's go in chapter 13 of Revelation, verse 1 through 3. And I stood up on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Okay, so here in, in these verses, what is the name of this entity, the beast. And who gives him his power, seat, and authority? Dragon. The dragon. And who does the Bible say the dragon is? Satan. 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 <laughs> so Satan is behind this beast. And it also says that this beast speaks blasphemy. Okay, so does does this sound like the same entity as the man of sin or the son of perdition or Antichrist? Yes. Okay, so let's go to the last text in this section, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So what is the name of this entity? Little, 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 little horn. horn. And what does it say? He has a mouth speaking what? Great, great things. things. Great things. And verse 25 says he speaks against the Most High. So if he speaks, since he speaks against the Most High, who is behind him? Satan. So it's the same entity as these other three names. So when does this Antichrist, man of sin, son of perdition, beast, little horn, power, come, um, come to power? So we'll look at some history, and we're going to look at um, verses one through three of chapter of the same chapter. Chapter 7? Yeah, chapter 7 of Daniel. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Okay, so Daniel has this vision, and he sees four winds driving on the sea, and four, and four beasts come up out of the sea. 
So let's break this apart. What First, what do the winds represent? Let's go to Jeremiah. This is just a um, side text. We'll have two side texts. So we're going to go to Jeremiah 49 and verses 36 and 37. Find out what winds represent. Daniel, not Daniel, Jeremiah 49 verses 36 through 37. And upon Elam will I bring four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and will scatter them toward all those winds. And there shall be no more nation whither the outcast of Elam shall not come. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before them that seek their life. And I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord. And I will send the sword after them, till I have consumed them. So here is paralleled, God says, I'm going to send four winds against this country, and I'm going to send, in the next verse it says, I will send the sword after them and their enemies after them. So winds equal what? Storm or war, war and war. strife. Very good. And so, okay, so back to Daniel's vision. So he sees the four winds of the heaven striving upon the sea. So the winds represent war and strife and the sword. Now what does the sea represent? Let's go to Revelation 17, 15. Revelation 17, 15. To me, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse stood, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So, what does um, water, uh, waters represent? Lots of people. Lots, Lots of, people. of people. Yes. Okay. So he, Daniel, sees back to his vision, four winds or war and strife upon the great sea, which is people, people, lots of yeah, populated places, and then verse. Three, the four great beasts. Let's go to Daniel 7, well, the same chapter then, I guess, verses 17 and 23. which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. Okay, so we see here that the beasts are what? Kings. Kings, kings and in verse 23, and their kingdoms. kingdoms. Okay, so Daniel sees um, war and strife upon the populated places and these four, he sees four great kingdoms, kings and their kingdoms come up out of the populated areas. Okay, so let's go to verse 4 to find out what the first beast is like. vision in Daniel chapter 2, how many um, metals were there? How many kingdoms were there? Five. Before it was divided? Four. Four. So there's four be four kingdoms, and I mean four metals, and there's four king beasts, and they, they line up together. 
was Babylon. What was the first kingdom? <laughs> Babylon. 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 And was Babylon like a lion and an eagle in its power and speed? Yes. Okay, so this first um, king beast or kingdom represents Babylon. Now let's look at verse 5. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in, in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, arise devour much flesh. Alright, so this next beast is like a bear, and what was the next kingdom in Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Medo Persia. Medo Persia. And um, these three ribs represent the, um, or when Medo Persia, Medo-Persia came into power. It took out three um, countries. I believe it was Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. And the um, Persia was stronger in power than Media, and that's why the bear is represented as raised up on one side. So let's look at verse 6 for the next kingdom. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Alright, so what was the next kingdom in Nebuchadnezzar's dream? The leopard. Greece. Greece. And in this vision it is represented as a leopard, and it had four wings. Now is a leopard um, really slow? No. no. <laughs> they're very fast. And if you add wings to them, they're even swifter. And when Alexander took over the um, over the over took over Media Persia, he did it in a very fast manner. And then after he died, um, his kingdom was divided into how many sections? Four. His four generals took um, took dominion of four sections of his kingdom, and that is represented by the heads. And I, their names are Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And they, so dominion was given to this beast. Let's look at the last kingdom, or beast. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Alright, so what was the next kingdom in Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Rome. Rome. And this fits very closely. Um, for one, the iron teeth fit the iron legs. But also, in the description of the iron in Daniel chapter 2, and this description of this beast, it says that it would break in pieces and subdue all things. And then it also, this beast has ten horns. So, um, and then this, and then verse 8 says, and I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. So it's at this time when the little horn comes up. Alright, so, let's see, um, let's read verse 8. I'll read verse 8 and 24. I consider the little horn, the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And verse 24 says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be divided from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So, what are the what are the horns? Kings. Kings. So in if you remember in Daniel chapter two, what happened to Rome? Was it conquered? No. No. It was divided into how many sections? Ten sections. So this beast has how many horns? Ten horns. And what are the horns? Kings. Kings. So these horns represent the ten kingdoms that Rome was divided into. And then this little horn comes up. 
among them. All right, so now that we have, we know when this Antichrist power, about when it comes up, um, let's look at its characteristics. Let's read verse, well, we just read verse 8 and 24. And what is it, it's call, what is it called in, in verse 8? A little horn. So, and in verse 24, what, are, what do horns represent? Kings. Kings. So this, if horns represent kings, then a little horn would represent what? A little king. A little king. So, <laughs> point, <laughs> point number one, or A, is that it is a little kingdom. Okay? I'm not writing it great. Nicely because I want you to remember it, not by what was written there, but what is in your head. So, does that make sense? It's a little kingdom. Okay, so let's look at the next point. Verse 8, um, it says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn. So where does the horn come up? Among, among the others. Among the other. So it be, comes up among others. Okay? Alright, does that make sense? Mm. Okay. So, then verse 8, when does, does it come up when it says, I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Does this little horn come up before the horns are, ten horns are mentioned, or after the ten horns are mentioned? After, after the ten horns. After. So, does this little, and what, and the horns represent what? Kings. Kings, kings and their the kings kingdom. and their kingdoms, and, and, but specifically in history, what does those ten kings represent? Divisions of Rome. Divided Rome, yes. Okay, so it, does it, um, this little horn, does it come up before Rome is divided? Or after it's divided. After. after. After it's divided. So, point C. It comes up after Rome is divided. 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 In 476 BC. AD. Excuse me. AD. I was thinking it's like when I looked down. Okay. So. Okay. So does that make sense? That it comes up after Rome is divided in 476 A.D. So was Rome divided in 476? Yes. Okay. Rome was divided in 476. So this horn has to come up, or after comes up after 476. All right. Then verse eight says, "Before whom, or before this little horn." There were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So, this little horn, when he comes up, what does he do? He takes out three, out. He takes out three of the horns. And how does he take them out? Yeah. By the roots. By the roots. They're not coming back. Yeah. Okay, and then verse 24 says that the he shall subdue what? Three kings. Three kings. So, this... Little horn power, when he comes up, he will pluck up or destroy three horns or three kingdoms. Correct. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Plucks up three horns. Okay. Then verse 24 says, And another shall rise after them, and he shall be what? Diverse. Diverse from the first, or the f other horns. So, he is he like these other kingdoms? No. No, no different. he's different. So, he, he is different. I really do not write <laughs> sideways very well. Then... That's why you put all the points on our papers. Other kingdoms. kingdoms. Yes. This is why we have paper. This is why you have memory. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> then <laughs> verse 8 
says, And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So if it has eyes like a man and a mouth speaking great things, it, um, it, ha it has a prominent man as its head. Does that make sense? Or is this? Yeah. Does that make sense? No? Oh, I'm glad you told me because I want to, you know, if it doesn't make sense and you're all confused, oh, that's not yeah. a good thing. That's not a good thing. Okay. Say it a different way. Okay. So, it says this little horn has eyes like a man and a mouth speaking. So it has a, all the other horns were just horns, but this one has a man characteristic. So it has a man as kind of its leader or its predominant. Part. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Okay. So, F is yeah a, a prominent man representing it. Yeah. Prominent man. Ent. Ent. <laughs> man. Uh, speaking. Okay. Now let's go to um. <coughs> Oh, and just a side note, what I did for all of these points is I just, some of you may have wider margins than others, but I just, in my margin, I put all, is there, what, 10 points in the side with the point and then the verse that you get from, because that's, that's, so you don't have to reference back and forth because you're basically just those two verses you're referencing back and forth, so that might be there. Let's look at verse 25 of Daniel chapter 7. So, the same, same chapter. Verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times, and the dividing of time. Okay, so this little horn shall speak what? Great, great words, words against the Most High. Okay, so he speaks great words against the Most High. Now, um, I did it. I, when I was reading through this, um, when I was reading through this, I was thinking that, um, you know, is there a connection? What's the connection? I mean, what is there a connection between something and speaking against the Most High? So I looked up the phrase and I came across Second Chronicles, which is really interesting. So, what does this speaking against the great, speaking great words against the Most High, mean? Let's go to Second Chronicles. Just a side note. Yeah, but you'll see it in the Bible. Yeah, Second Chronicles. It's really cool. Second Chronicles, chapter thirty-two. Second Chronicles, chapter thirty-two, and verse seventeen. And he wrote also letters to rail on the God of heaven, God of Israel, and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of mine hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of mine hand. So this king, I believe it was Sennacherib, is writing, he wrote letters to rail on the God of Israel and to speak against him. So rail is connected to what? Speaking against, speaking against God. Okay, so I looked up the word rail, and in the Hebrew, it's the word karaf, which means to rail, to reproach, or to blaspheme. So he wrote letters to blaspheme God, and it's connected. It's the same thing as speaking against him. Does that make sense? So when this little horn speaks against the Most High, he's doing what? Blaspheming God. And what does blasphemy, um, what is blasphemy? Let's look at two verses, Mark 2, verse 7. Mark chapter 2 and verse 7.
Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Okay, so why, excuse me, why were they um, accusing Jesus of blasphemy? Because he was claiming to do something God to do. Yes, because he was claiming to forgive sins. And, which he could because he was God, but they didn't want to believe that, and so they said that he was committing blasphemy. So blasphemy is, number one, claiming to forgive sins, and let's look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verse 33, 30 to 33. John chapter 10, verse 30 to 33. I and my Father are one. And then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you for my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, madest thyself God. Alright, so we saw in Mark that blasphemy was claiming to do what? Forgive sins. Forgive sins, and here blasphemy is claiming to be God. Okay, so this little horn power will commit blasphemy, and that is claiming to forgive sins and claiming to be God. So, G, it commits blasphemy. All right, now let's go to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 21 and 25. Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 21 and 25. I beheld in the same horn made with the saints and prevailed against them. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given unto his hand until a time and the dividing of time. Alright, so here it says this little horn made what? War with the saints. War with the saints. And in verse 25, he wears out the saints, and they'll be given to, into his hand for a certain time. So, it is a persecuting power. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Alright. So, if you see G, H. My alphabet mixed up. Persecuting. Persecuting. Power. All right. So let's see the last point. Okay, so let's go do a little review. First point was it is a the little kingdom. kingdom. Second point is comes up among others. Comes up among others. And number C, Alan. You had it on the last one. Oh, it comes after four seven. Comes, yeah, it comes after Rome. Divided. B. It is a. Flux. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> See, it's memory. Yeah. yeah. So it's not not coming Flux up yet. three horns. Uh, e. Is different from other kingdoms. F. Prominent man speaking. Prominent man speaking. Eyes of man. G. It's blasphemy. And H is a persecuting power. Okay, and now we're ready for I. Second to last one. And let us, it's just in verse 25, and it says, Shall wear out the saints the most high and do what? Think to change times and laws. Okay, that one's pretty simple. Think to change times and laws. All right, and the last one, it says, 
and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So, this little horn power rules for how long? Time, times, and the dividing of time. So, what does this mean? What is a time? One year. One year. And what? So, what would be times? Two years. And the dividing of time would be half a year. Okay. So, if I have room over here, I need to like move it all over. <laughs> Push really hard. Just imagine yeah. it. Moving. Imagine it was <laughs> like. Okay, so we'll write right here because we have a little room. Okay, so we have one year, two years, and one half years. Three and a half years. And that equals three and a half years. All right. So, <clears throat> is this power to rule for three and a half years? Well, let us see. Um, let's go to, there is a slight change in, I found a um, typo in here. It is not Ezra 7, chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 7. It is <coughs> Ezekiel, chapter 6, chapter 4, rather. <laughs> chapter 4 and verse 6. I don't know what Ezra 7 7 came from. It didn't really. No, At first I thought it was just the books mixed up because I always get Ezra and Ezekiel mixed up anyway. But 7 7 doesn't have anything to do with Yeah, okay, so we'll look. Ezekiel 4 6 and Numbers 14 34 is basically the same thing. So we could look at one or the other and get basically the same thing. So let's go to Ezekiel 4, 6, since we're closer to that. So, whoever is next, I would like to read Ezra, not Ezra, Ezekiel 4, verse 6. Emily? Yes. I, I got it, I just ran out of Ezra, isn't Ezra 7, 7 the one where it shows what date the other prophecy started? You know that I'll bet you're right. Because it probably, says Yeah. It says and there went up some of the children of Israel and the and of yeah. the priests and the Levites and the singers and the porters and, and some of blah 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 unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. Uh, yeah. I'll bet that's that's what it is. Yeah. Which we somebody that's set it up. in the Daniel nine study where we actually did determine where the They probably the went and like were like, Oh, we'll copy all the day for a year text and they copied them but they accidentally got Or it. maybe maybe when they were putting the study out they uh, just remembered in their head where the verse was and they got the Ezra oh. 7 7 and they equal 4 6 mixed up. Yeah, Ezekiel and Ezra, that's really easy. So, and this is Pastor Scott's study, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, let's go to. Let's look at Ezekiel 4 6. Oh. Whose turn is it? Mine? Mine? I think it's Joshua's. Oh, I'm. That is very cool. Yeah, you your turn. Oh, I guess it's mine. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Alright, so in prophecy, each day equals what? A year. A year. A year. So, let us see. How many days would this equal? One year is how many days? 360. Yeah. It's 360, because it's Hebrew calendar. Yeah. Uh, Otherwise it would. Otherwise it would be 65, but then you have to be at 66. Is it 66? Don't you get an extra day? Leap year? Uh, they didn't have leap years. Yeah, but they didn't have all that, so it's just 360. Yeah, just 360. everything after yeah. Um, Two years would be how many days? 620. Yeah, 720. Yeah. <laughs> and one half year would be? One. One eighty days, which all together equals zero, six, ten, sixteen, three, seven is ten plus two is twelve. Twelve hundred and sixty.
day. Days. Or years. Years. <laughs> Real years. Okay, so a day in proxy equals a year. <laughs> equals year. a year. So this equals how many years? 1260 years. 1260 years. So the last point is this entity rules, this little one power rules for 1260 literal years or three and a half prophetic years. All right. So, is there any power on earth or in history that lines up with all three, all oh, ten of these? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Of course. There's, yes. there's got to be. Who, do you have, any of you have any idea who it might be? No. <laughs> oh no. Well, like Catholic, no, no. Catholic priests, Church. you confess to the priest rather than to God and they forgive you. In place of God. So is there a, who, who is it? Who is the Antichrist? The church. You don't have to be afraid to answer. answer. <laughs> Just answer you, what you're thinking know. and we'll look at the fact. Oh. So who is it? Well, it's not the, the Pope. Well, you've had there's different two of the right <laughs> answers. And two of the right answers. I yeah. must admit. Yeah, I Bethany must said it and I said it. Okay. Paper room, do you all agree to that? <laughs> okay, so let's see if it matches up. Turn your page. And we're going to look. Do you have a turn page? Oh, you already turned your page. Okay. So the first point is Papal Rome a little pow, a little kingdom? Yep. Let's look. Located within Rome, Vatican City is the smallest state in Europe and in the world. It is a roughly triangular area of 0.44 square kilometers or 0.17 square miles, lying near the west bank of the Tiber River and to the west of the Castel Santa Elando. It's a city. So, is it a small kingdom? Yes. Yeah. Extremely small. Yes. yes. All right. Check. <laughs> All right. Next point comes up among others. Located in Italy, Rome is the center of the old Roman Empire or modern Europe. Does this fit? Yep. All right. Okay. Comes up after Rome is divided in 476 AD. Rome divided in 476 AD when odd Doser, I don't know how you say that. <laughs> King of Heruli deposed of Romulus Augustulius, last Western Roman Emperor in 476 AD, and the fragmentation of the Roman Empire was complete, and Papal Rome had not come up yet. Does this fit? Yep. All right. Check. Okay. D. Plucks up or destroys three horns or kingdoms. The papacy comes to power in 538. The Roman church did uproot three of the ten kingdoms. The Vandals in 534 AD, the Heruli in 593 AD, and the Ostrogoths in 538 AD. These three Aryan kingdoms were a threat to the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome, later called the Pope. To make a long story short, these three kingdoms eventually were uprooted by the imperial emperor power acting under the influence of the Bishop of Rome. It is of great significance that in 533 AD, Justinian proclaimed a decree which recognized the Pope's headship over all the churches of East and West. This decree was actually a letter written by Justinian to Pope John. But the Ostrogoths were still a threat to the supremacy of the Pope. They were uprooted in, in February 538 AD. Thus Justinian's decree went into effect, making the Bishop of Rome supreme. Does this fit? Yep. yep. All right. Just check. E. Different than the other kingdoms. The Bishop of Rome in the seat of the Caesars was now the greatest man in the West and was soon forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head. To the Western world, Rome was still the political capital. Hence the world, habit of mind, all ambition, pride, and sense of glory in every 
social prejudice favored the evolution of the great city into its ecclesiastical capital. Civil as well as religious disputes were referred to as the successor of Peter for settlement. Does this fit? Yep. All right. Check. Okay, a prominent man speaking. Real quick. Yes. How would you summarize that in one sentence? The Bishop of Rome? E. E. How is it different? That it is most most kingdoms are just political. And it was both political ecclesiastical and, and political power. So Rome is the head and has complete authority over the church. Does this fit? Rome is? Pope. Sorry, the Pope yep. is the head and has complete authority over the church. Check. All right, so it commits blasphemy. Here's a quote from The Dignity and Duties of the Priests, excerpt page 27, where it says, And God himself is obliged to do what? Obliged. Abide by the judgment of his priests and either to not to pardon or to pardon. to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. absolution. And then Pope Leo the 8th, 7th, 12th, 12th. This is Roman numerals. <laughs> Pope Leo the 12th said, We hold on earth the place of. God Almighty. So, does this commit, does this fit that it commits blasphemy? Yes. yes. <laughs> Alright. Check. Persecuting power. From the history of the rise of the spirit of rationalism in Europe, volume 2, page 32, it says that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by what? No Protestant. No Protestant who has a complete knowledge Compl of competent <laughs> knowledge. Of history. Does this fit? Yep. Yes. yes. Check. Check. All right. <laughs> Number I. Think to change times and laws. In Lucis Freus, Freus, Freus. in Pomta Bithyopa Canosia, Canonica. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the Pope is of great authority and power that he is able to modify, declare, or interpret even the divine laws. The Pope can modify divine laws since his power is not of man but of God and he acts as vicegerent of God upon earth. So, does this fit? Yep. yep. Yeah. Check, check. All right, and the last one. Does, oh wait. Oh, we have to Ten see. Ten boy. So we have here on the paper just the Ten Commandments, and you can see that uh, on the left is the Ten Commandments in the Bible, and the right is the Ten Commandments in the Catechism. Great. And you can see that they didn't really care for the graven images <laughs> one, so they took that one out, moved number three and all the rest behind up one, and then but that wouldn't work because then you only have nine commandments, and so they split the tenth one in half. So it's you shall not covet your neighbor's wife is number nine, and you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Oh, and then number in three and number four. Ten. They changed the wording. Oh, yes. They that. changed the wording on, instead of remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, remember the Lord's day to keep it holy. Uh, I can say whatever day the Lord's day is. Exactly. So. And they also changed the first one to say strange gods. Instead yeah. of any gods. Yeah. It's like yeah. strange. No. So if the Pope's not really strange, then <laughs> <laughs> all the Pope has to do is define what the Lord's Day is, and then the yeah, Lord's or what a strange God is, or yeah. like, oh, this one's not strange. <laughs> all right, so this that fits. Yep. Okay. Then the last one. Does did it actually yeah, rule it. for twelve hundred and sixty years? Yep. In. A plea for religion and sacred writings says, It is not extremely remarkable, and a powerful confirmation of the truth of the scripture, a, a confirmation of the truth of scripture prophecy, that just 1260 years ago from the present, 1798, in the very beginning of the year 538, 
Belisarius put an end to the empire of the Goths at Rome, leaving no power therein but the bishops at the metropolis. Read these things in the prophetic scriptures, and then I say again, deny the truth of divine revelation, if you can. Open your eyes and behold these things accomplishing in the face of the whole world. This thing is not done in a corner. All right, so the, uh, it's a historic fact that the people, Roman Empire, pro, people Roman Empire, ruled from 538 AD to 5 to 1798 AD. Does this fit? Yes. Yep. All right. So does everything? Does everything fit? Yes. Yes. Um, well, it looks like yeah. it. So, who is the Antichrist? Papal Rome. Rome. Papal Rome. And who is behind the Antichrist? Satan. 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 Then, who is behind Papal Rome? Satan. 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 And what do we read in Revelation 13? The dragon gave his power, power, power to see and the glory, glory to the beast. And the beast. And the beast is Papal Rome. Rome. Papal Rome. So, does this mean that all Catholics are not going to heaven? No. 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 If they are living up to the light God has given them, um, he will bring them out. It's the system that is controlled by Satan. And like I said at the beginning, I'll say it again, God wants us to know the truth so that we won't be deceived. And the point isn't the Antichrist. The point is that Satan is behind the Antichrist. And he wants worship, and so he's working through this entity to deceive us and try to get our worship. Let's go to our last text, Joshua 24 and verse 15. Joshua 24 and verse 15. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So it's our choice. And we may not be faced today with necessarily deciding whether we're going to follow Christ or the Antichrist as papal Rome, but we have a choice day by day to decide whether we're going to tr follow Jesus Christ or Satan, who is behind the Antichrist. So do we want to be controlled by Satan and have him as our master? Or do we want Jesus to be the Lord and Master of our lives? And let him take control and guide us. Mm -hmm. The choice is yours and mine. Whom will we choose? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can study in your word and see so clearly without a shadow of a doubt that you have laid before us who the Antichrist power is and that it is papal Rome and that as it ruled in the past so it will in the future and we ask that you would help us day by day to live for you and to let you be the master and lord of our life so that when the time comes when we must stand against the Antichrist as a entity that we will have you as our master then and we ask I ask that you would that we would choose you today and every day until you come in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.